start the recording from now. Um, and I'd like to start this meeting by doing an acknowledgement of country. Um, firstly, La Trobe University acknowledges that this event and our participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and value their unique contribution to the university and wider Australian society. We pay our respects to Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to any Indigenous participants joining us online today. So thank you everybody for coming on board. Just a couple of housekeeping. Um, if you'd like to turn on your cameras, that'll be really, really great. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I will get to you. Um, and you can say it over camera or if you're a bit shy today, feel free to uh, jump it into the chat and I will um, ask the question. Um, we have an hour and 15 minutes. So try to use that hour and 15 minutes as much as you can um, and ask as many questions as possible. We'll try to squeeze them in and any that go unanswered, I'll try and follow them up after the session. Um, so firstly, I would like to ask the students to please fill out the attendance form. So I'm just gonna put it into the chat. One moment. And if you can fill that out, that'll be great, especially those that have applied for the career advantage points. So if you can fill that out, that would be great. Um, so yeah, so I'd like to introduce our first panellist. So we have Michael, the Senior Consultant at EY um, in Financial Services Risk Management. I'll start off with Michael. Um, if you can give us an overview of your career and a summary of what you've studied and the types of jobs that you've had. Are oh, you just on mute? Well, still haven't gotten used to getting off mute. Um, that's, okay. so that's, that's a good one. Um, hey guys, nice to meet you all virtually. Um, Kat made sure that I mentioned that I am a La Trobe alumni, um, really thoroughly enjoyed my time there. Um, I studied a Bachelor of, of Law and Finance, um, it took me five years to complete. Um, so I think I graduated in 2016. Um, after graduation, I did my um, went to College of Law um, to get my diploma um, in legal practices. Um, much to my family's dismay though, didn't go on to be a lawyer and um, chose the financial route instead. Um, so my first, I guess, full-time job was with NAB. Um, I'm sure many of you will know them. You might have a NAB card in your wallet. Um, I was with NAB for about five years. Um, with them, I worked um, in various roles. Um, I'll quickly touch on them. So I worked in um, dispute resolutions. So dealing with customer complaints. Um, I dealt with remediation. So some of you may or may not be aware of the Royal Commission that took place um, into um, the banking industry, um, so work very closely with that. And then my final role was in regulatory response. Um, just recently, um, I moved over to Ernest & Young, uh, which is a prof professional services firm. So only been there for a month um, and consulting in our financial services risk management team. So that's me. Um, I'm sure we'll get to know each other as we go along, um, but nice to meet everyone again. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I'll go over to you, Kate. Um, so if you can give an overview on your career and a summary of what you've studied and the types of roles and organisations that you've worked for and what you're working for now. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks for taking your time to jump on today. As a student, it's I've gone back many, many years ago now for me, but it is a great opportunity for people to um, you know, explore what are the options are you know, beyond um, uni. So welcome and congratulations for taking the time to invest in yourself today. Um, from my perspective, I um, am a, a graduate or alumni from uh, La Trobe in Bendigo. So I studied here. I grew up in central Victoria. Uh, at that stage, I wasn't ready to make the, the leap to Melbourne and uh, decided to study in Bendigo. I did a double degree of um, Bachelor of Business in Asia Pacific Studies. So that included a, a language, a Mandarin Chinese, and uh, more broadly, uh, sort of economic and social um, subjects around impacting the Asia Pacific region. So real bit of a diverse one. Uh, I then was lucky enough to get a graduate position at what was back then uh, Price Waterhouse, not Price Waterhouse Coopers as it's now known. Um, so I started there in back in 1996. So quite a few years ago now. I think we've just celebrated our 25 years with uh, my my group sort of from back then. Uh, I spent five years at um, PwC, it was by the end of that, in the audit division, so both internal and external audit, we had um, a variety of experience across both of those. And uh, it was a great opportunity to really get inside some big businesses, um, you know, the Coles, the Telstra's, um, the Kodaks of the world back 
many years ago again. Um, from there, I went into industry. I was quite keen to explore and be within a business um, that I could contribute to rather than sort of auditing one is, is how I was feeling at that time. And I joined Blockbuster Australia. So uh, again, both I'm showing my age here. Um, those of you who uh, remember the old video rental chain, uh, that's, that's where I was. I was the finance manager there and went through to be finance director before I left. Um, my last role within that organisation was actually selling the business or being quite a heavily part of that, uh, that sale process. Um, because as you all know, um, Netflix kicked in and, um, you know, I think in the CA program, they do a bit of a, a blurb and, and a case study on Blockbuster. And um, yeah, it, it's one of those iconic businesses that unfortunately, um, you know, technology and they didn't move. And to see what happened with that, that was quite an experience. At that stage, we moved back up to Bendigo. My husband's from up here as well. We had a small child um, and I just wanted some interesting work that stimulated me, but I didn't want to work uh, full time at that stage. And I fell back into public accounting, um, thought I'd never end up back here, but um, went back into audit a um, couple of kids later. And I sort of kept going back to that organisation and saying, this is what I love doing. I don't love doing this. And I, I um, ended up um, in a general manager role there. And uh, that morphed into the CEO role a couple of years ago. So uh, really enjoy um, working at AFS. It's an organisation of about 80 team members. We've just ticked over the 80. We are a professional services firm um, covering both audit and business services. So our team's pretty much split 50-50. Um, so I, I love the management side of things and organisational development. Um, but you can see that that's grown from um, an accounting background to start with. Thanks, Kate. Um, Blockbuster, that just brought back so many memories. Um, I actually missed going to the video store, so that was nice and nostalgic. Thanks for that. Um, so, Anthony, if you can um, give us an overview of your career. Sure thing. Hi, Kathleen. Uh, everyone, pleasure to be here today. Um, as you can tell from the accent, I'm not from Australia. I'm from the UK. Like, really sort of very, not very interesting story. Fact is, my wife's Australian. One day I came home, she had my visa forms ready for me and was like, right, you should sign here. And five years later, I've been loving it over this side. Um, I studied like business management back in the UK and I started my career off in the world of HR. Like many people, I just fell into HR based around um, an internship that I did at an aircraft engines factory. Absolutely fascinating to see these large engines come into the overhaul shop and then just work out like him being tested, getting fixed, shipped back out. But um, first role sort of out of uni, I joined an HR grad program, got some amazing exposure to journalist HR work, but also got involved in uh, graduate recruitment and also some HR consulting. Um, for me, I was like, oh, I've been told, you know, start your career as an HR generalist. I was like, no, nah, actually, I really want to specialise. So I specialise more in graduate recruitment development, work for a law firm amazing in terms of working through around point of going out working on attraction campaigns doing a whole interview and assessing of individuals then working out rotations of their own program and then where they're going to fall into post their grad programs um you know when sort of Kate was there talking about um the likes of PwC so I worked there in the UK for many years on PwC's graduate recruitment as they were like professional services firms are recruited across all their areas from consulting through to assurance through to business recovery oh all these great things um loved it but that was more focused on recruitment I thought oh I'll go back in development so work for an insurance company look at their graduate development programs managing that in the UK across in Australia um again you can see my passion for that whole support from early careers and thinking how can you make those shifts you know from your passions at uni what does that look like in a career so I continued working this time I worked at and um realestate.com so REA group Coles went back to PwC in Australia for a bit and now I'm over at Trust Accountants and um my role here is I have the amazing privilege of working with people like Marissa who's on the call here who's part of the team but um my team just get out there and start to showcase you know what what is accounting it's not that boring profession that people sit there and look at spreadsheets you know there's a lot of that advising around it so great to try and think about how can change those perceptions and then work with amazing sort of ca members like jake um, and, and and picture partners sort of down there and bring build those connections through so pleasure to be here look forward to chatting more around the account profession also in graduate recruitment development as well thanks anthony and lastly, Jake Cricket from Senior Analyst at Picture Partners, if you can tell us a little bit about your career journey. 
Hi, Ron. Nice to meet you virtually as well. Um, like Michael, I'm also an alumni from La Trobe University in Bandura. Um, so I spent uh, about four years there studying a double degree in accounting and finance. Uh, I graduated at the end of 2015. Um, and then spent the majority of 2016 uh, trying to land myself a graduate role. So um, I was quite disorganised at the start of my career, so to speak. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I'd gotten the degree. I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, I had a friend of mine who was working in a different uh, part of Picture Partners at the time, and he was really enjoying it. Um, and an opportunity opened up in what was called their corporate affairs team. Um, so the corporate affairs team um, works with the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. So it's a bit of a liaison between uh, ASIC and the firm. Um, so it deals with all the firm's uh, financial statement lodgements, um, deals with any issues that arise, any changes to company details, incorporating companies and so on. Um, so I spent a year working in the corporate affairs team before um, an opportunity opened up in the private business and family advisory team, which I now work in um, at the moment. Um, and I was able to get into the graduate um, program. Um, so that was a, back in 2018, um, I started um, effectively as a graduate in accounting. Um, so as a full year program, uh, trying to learn the ropes, trying to pick up as much as possible. Um, steep learning curve, lots of hard work. But um, from there, I've pretty much spent my time just working my way up. Um, over the course of the following years, um, I'm now a senior analyst in uh, the same team that I started in as a graduate. So again, in our private business and family advisory division. Um, and typically we um, our work revolves around high net worth clients, uh, small and medium enterprise. Um, and we basically act as a, almost like a jack of all trades, but um, also as their exter external accountant, sort of a first port, port of call um, for any accounting tax related issues. And then we go away and we um, come back with some advice or um, it can take the form of a conversation with a client. It can take the form of a more formal written piece of advice. Um, we help them out with all their sort of tax lodgements and tax obligations, but there's also a, a, an element of advisory work that sort of trickles in over the course of the year. Um, so sort of no, no two days are the same. Um, there's plenty of variety in the work that I do. I uh, work with uh, small, medium manufacturers, uh, property-based clients, uh, some of the larger investment clients that we have. Um, and then my career has sort of taken another turn in the managed fund space. So dealing with a lot of investment funds um, and the fund managers around that. Um, so yeah, once again, uh, good to meet you all and uh, certainly looking forward to any questions you might have of, of, um, of us. Thanks, Jake. Um, sounds like everybody have had such a great career and different variety and have landed different types of jobs in the industry that they probably didn't know when um, they were doing their degree. So one of my questions that um, I would like to ask is what kind of skills and personal qualities that enable get graduates to thrive in your organisation? So what are some transferable skills um, and things that are essential? Um, I'll start with Kate, if you can answer that question and anybody else want to just jump in. Yeah, thanks, Catalina. Look, look, I think um, from, a, from an employer's perspective, we know that you can learn when you come out of uni. So you've been able to learn a variety of, uh, you know, um, streams that you may have, um, you know, touched on over your three years. And, and to get to the end of the degree in your piece of paper, we know you can learn. So a key thing for us is to know um, that you're going to fit also within our organisation from a, um, a team dynamic perspective. So quite often what we're doing when we're looking um, for people to come into our business is to make sure that they've got some, you know, extracurricular activities that demonstrates they've had great teamwork, that they've been able to um, invest in of themselves in their community, um, that they have, you know, also gained from that a number of experiences that hasn't just been streamed um, through your university career. Um, 
you know, the last 18 months has shown us the, the open-mindedness and the ability to take opportunities and grow and be flexible is really important. Um, as an employer, we've, uh, we've asked out a lot of our team over the last 12 months in, in terms of the way that they work now. Um, and those who have really surprised me are, are the ones that have just gone, yep, I'm going to take it, you know, we're going to re totally rework the way we do things. Um, you know, we're going to look for the positive in everything and, you know, we're going to be open and flexible to sort of learn and grow. And that's, that's I think, um, really important in terms of those critical skills from a personality and the way that you approach your work and your life. Um, critical skills from a technical perspective is around um, that attention to detail. It is also around those sort of leadership qualities. And, and we talk about um, you lead yourself first and, you know, you are a leader. You don't have to be a manager or a senior to and, and supervising people to take to take those or to gain those skills. We you know we want to see you as an independent leader. Um, so it's really sort of having to think about how that might come off in everything that you do. Um, and then the other thing is um, good communication skills. So it's being able to talk to clients. It's being able to ask questions of your supervisor. It's being able to give um, feedback back to your supervisor or to peers as well. So it's sort of that. Um, you know, good quality conversation skill. So the top few, Catalina. Thanks, Kate. Um, anybody else would like to add to that? Oh, yeah, if you don't mind, I, I can jump in. I think absolutely agree with what, what Kate's saying there. And, you know, from ourselves as the, the professional body for the accounting industry, it is one of the big things we see, and I think it's so lovely how, how Kate explained it there, and just really want to stress everyone on the call, you know, how that focus really purely on those transferable skills. And when we talk technical, it was that attention to detail and to that approach on there. Because I know a lot of students really worry around, oh, do I need to go and like, ensure I've got that, you know, relevant work experience beforehead? Do I need to go and learn this software, that software? But, you know, as Kate so eloquently put it, it's more about you've got the capacity to learn, develop through what you've been doing at university, and you can be taught the technical but it is those other elements around that, that fit, that's so important. And that's what we're hearing from every single employer that we work with is, okay, I need that that person there who can, you know, one of the core cool skills is that ability to really sort of listen to what's being asked of them, what's being said, and that ability to ask that right questions, sort of post that and think, about, okay, what what, am I, what do I need to get out of this? What What is that person really saying to me? How can I ensure I've got the best possible information sort of going through from there? And that mindset, that positive mindset of, you know, going through, I think definitely at the start of your career, just being eager and open to get involved in that whole variety of tasks, because that's what you see when you see a lot of people progressing through the career. They're the ones who are going, you know what, yeah, I'm going to get involved in this and, you know, really help build up my skills by just saying yes to things, obviously balance it to make sure we can get everything done in the time frame you've got available. Well, that's like a huge part as you sort of go through there and that relationship with communication skills as well, you know absolutely first way the ability to go and work there as part of a team and build those long trust and relationships that are, you know so so valuable as you move forward anybody else like to add to that uh yeah i just might uh, jump in as well so i completely agree with kate and anthony uh in terms of um those soft skills that are transferable the leadership qualities everything around that and the fact is technical skills can be taught the university degree is showing us that you can be taught um, at the end of it. Um, for a bit of background, our graduate intake consists of a mix of non-accounting grads and accounting grads. So there's, uh, we go into this expecting an element that uh, needs to be taught. We have about a third of our graduates now come from non-accounting backgrounds. So we're really focusing on uh, those soft skills. Um, I'm gonna borrow the words of, um, a partner in our firm, Nick Bull, uh, told me this when I first started as a graduate. He was, it's part of a speech of his, so I hope he doesn't mind. But um, there's a feeling you get when you're taking on something new, a bit of a nervous energy. You might even feel a bit nauseous, a bit sick about it. Now, he calls it the good sick feeling. And something that's always stuck with me is his words to embrace the good sick feeling and to get out of your comfort zone. So I just want to share those with you. Um, it's important to take on opportunities. It's, you're going to feel uncomfortable at times, but um, it's not a bad thing, even though you might feel a bit sick about it, it's a good thing. So it's, that's why we sort of call it a good sick feeling. Might, might just jump in there, Kat, as well. Um, just everyone's 
agree with my fellow panelists there. And if I reflect on what I was thinking as a graduate going into the workforce, there was two things that really stood out to me. I was always thinking um, kind of, what is it exactly that I want out of this degree? Where, where am I wanting to go? Um, and are these questions that I have in my head a silly question? And should I already know the answer? Um, my advice is to you ask as many questions as you want. There is no such thing as a silly question as you've probably heard a bunch of times. And I think really embrace the culture that we have this day and age. Everything's over Zoom or Teams. So it's probably less confrontational than meeting someone up for a coffee. Hit people up over LinkedIn. I'm sure all of us on the call today will be more than happy for you to jump on our LinkedIn and send us a message if you have any questions, but really network, network, network. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, yeah, jump right in. So thanks guys. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Jake, for sharing that sick feeling, because I do get those sick feelings when I'm about to um, embrace, like, embrace a new project, even facilitating this session. I've never done facilitating before. So this is like my first job doing it. And I remember feeling that feeling, thinking, oh, is this a bad thing? But it's actually a good thing. And it kind of gives you a bit of that excitement and drive and a bit of motivation as well. Um, so I'll jump into the next You're doing a great question. job, Catalina. A great oh, job you. so thank far. You. Okay, enjoying it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, my next question is, what does a graduate journey look like? Um, so I'm more focused on you know, your first job, like what to expect on your first job straight out of uni. Um, I'll start with Kate, if you can. Yeah, so sorry, Catalina, um, as in with, within AFS or our experience when we were graduates? Your experience and a little bit on, yeah, what would a graduate expect on their first job um, out in, they just finished their degree, they probably had no work experience and just a couple of tips to help them along the way to adjust into the workforce. Yeah, yeah, great. Look, from a, from a being the graduate perspective, it's about um, being open to opportunities, you know, meet, you know, you know Anthony, I think, oh, sorry, Michael, you commented on, um, unfortunately, the, the, the networking now looks very different, um, even as, you start as a new graduate, you're likely to have some element of either working remotely or the whole team won't be in the office with you. But it's about you know, um, making sure that you involve yourself and participate in everything possible to meet the rest of your team, uh, to engage yourself and get yourself uh, known, I suppose, within your organisation. Um, introduce yourself to people because that will just help solidify you and, and your role and your comfort level um, within an organisation or your more broader team. Um, I think from a personal perspective as well, that's some of the things that really made my graduate experience um, so positive. It was about we had a, a great little um, cohort, if you like, that started at the same time. Um, look, starting in a big four firm has a, a very big different maybe field for starting in a smaller organisation, but apply the same thing. It's, it's getting to know your cohort, getting that camaraderie around you, because at the end of the day, work's work. Um, and it's not going to matter where you do it. Um, it's it's about who you're doing it with and you're um, searching I think for an organization if you're lucky to have choice um, find an organization that really meets and satisfies you from a values and, and a cultural perspective as to what you're looking forward to and what you would what the environment that you want to work within as well um, it will just make uh, work um, that work-life balance and um, that that experience a lot more comfortable to know that I'm in an environment that I enjoy. I may be a bit out of my comfort zone in terms of learning, but I'll get there and um, yeah, just be really open to those opportunities. And, and don't be afraid to ask the question. Someone else mentioned it before. It's just so true. From an employer's perspective, when you come into our organisation, we don't expect you to know anything. Um, that's, I'm not being derogatory. I'm just saying we know that your university course will not teach you how to do the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it teaches you the theory and the end result and what you're trying to achieve, you know, maybe particularly around audit, it may be around risk and um, the framework and, and some of the, um, you know, obviously the accounting standards, but we don't expect you to know how to use our systems, um, what the work papers look like, that sort of things that we will teach you. And, and we sort of say it takes 12 months for somebody to learn. You've been through a whole cycle of a year and, and the thing and the different elements and types of roles you will do over a year, um, you know, it takes you a year to feel comfortable by the time you get around to doing it again you're like oh yeah I get this some of our processes are six monthly um, audits or reviews and um, you know they, they sort of come around a bit quicker but yeah we don't we, we, we expect you to come in with an open mind and a learning opportunity and in the first 12 months we'll teach you everything you need to know what we want to see though is progression um, so we want to see that 
know, you we talk about whips um, or how much time it takes to do something. Um, over that your career with us, we want to see the time to take things reduced because that means you're learning the skills, um, you're being able to be more efficient with your time. That's because you've either got a greater experience in terms of your knowledge or you're asking the right questions at the right time to be able to move through um, a, 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 a project or, or a job quicker. Um, so that's that's sort of our take on on that graduate side. Um, you know, it is a probably you know a, a two a two to two two and a half three year journey as that graduate, um, and then you sort of move into that more of a senior role where you're able to then start um, developing others around you. So anyone else add to that? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Michael. Are you going to go? You go. No, you can go ahead, Anthony. I'll go after you. Oh, too kind. Um, Oh, look, I think for everyone that transition from uni to work, it's super scary. I can look back on my my day and go, oh my gosh, I come from a place where I knew everything to, you know, as Kate's really put it there, you know nothing. And you're like, oh, how do I cope with this? What do I need to do? And it's that changed environment from like, okay, at uni, cool, I can go off, I've got my books, I can do some research, I can get my knowledge up that way. Whereas in that working world, it, it's all about, you know, having to learn from others. And that, that big piece there, and, and across my time of watching lots of grads come through, you know, as well as talking to different employers, what's the big thing? It's, it's okay, put your hand up, just ask for help. And, you know, that's the key thing where a lot of people just don't ask for help and try and model away by themselves. And next thing you know, it's like, oh my gosh, how do I get out of this? I can't get through this. So it's it just approaching people. Because rightly, you know, you've been hired for a reason. Everyone knows you've got the potential, but you're not going to know it right away. And how do you learn? It's by asking those questions. And the big thing is like not coming in with those questions like, oh, I don't know how to do this. It's like, well, um, I think I need to approach it in this way. I just want to go and really check that with you to make sure that's suitable. So I think the other piece is you're there, right? You're coming into that environment, you're at that early stage of your career, and you're like, oh my word, I've got to go and work with these people who are like, be it CEOs, partners of organizations, they're all like super scary. Ah, no, they're not. Everyone's pretty normal. Yeah, everyone's very relaxed. They've all been in that same position. It's remembering that everyone started their careers somewhere. You know, as you're hearing today, obviously from, from like Kate, from Jake, from Michael, you'll start somewhere and then work your way up. So they know what it's like being in that position. So there's no qualms in just asking that. That is looked upon so favorably that someone's there, they're asking it, they're looking for those insights. You're going off, you, you're taking what you've learned and trying to you know, put that into play. And you showcase the next time you work on a similar piece of work, you've shown that sort of step increase in your knowledge. That's a huge, huge part. So don't be afraid. I think, you know, rightly was saying there, ask those questions, get out there, look to get advice. There's so many people that you can talk to around it. But don't just go, it's like, oh, I've got a problem. Don't have to solve it. You've got to think about what your approach can be and then sort of go through and discuss that approach with someone. But I think that's the big thing of coming into that, that environment around there. And rightly say, networking the way. Just trying to build this relationship. So it, it, it's not just about that transactional piece of asking someone, like, how do I do this? How do I go X, Y, and Take the time to, like, find out things about your colleagues you know, and, and get interested. That's the big thing. It's about creating those relationships, that part of that team, that collaboration, all comes down to understanding an individual as a person, not just, oh, what do you do? Okay, great. Thank you very much. It's like, get to know them, have those just general conversations, which are great when you're in office. I know a lot harder when online. But, you know, organizations have some amazing things like, be it like coffee, catch up, coffee, roulette, meetings, where you can just have general chit chats with people to get to know them. You've got things like your, your chats on, be it Teams, Slack, other things, just to have, have a bit of that and build relationships. They're always a great thing to do. So thanks. Sorry, Michael. Uh, no, thanks for sharing there, Anthony. And I think I'm happy that I let you go first because I'm going to kick off where you kind of left off in terms of being involved in a new environment. And I think I'm in a position at EY now where I've only been there for a month. So I can kind of put myself in your shoes where I've gone from an organization where I kind of knew it all. I knew how NAB operated. I was really comfortable with the stakeholders I dealt with. And all of a sudden I'm in this really new environment. They, it's a completely different change in industry. And what I've got to constantly remind myself is that EY hired me for a reason. They, they look at what they saw on the paper and they say, yep, Michael, you have the transferable skills to come here and learn what we do, but we're going to bank on those transferable skills. I'm going to give that same advice to you guys. You're not going to get hired um, for no reason. It's because the employer sees something in you. 
whether it be on paper because of the degree that you've studied or really because of the communication during your interview. So really back yourself um, from day one, um, have some real confidence in the fact that the organization wants you to join the team and they think that you're gonna be a good part of the organization and make it a better place. Um, and also I'd imagine that you guys are gonna bring a bunch of fresh insights on, on challenging the way that organizations currently do things. Um, if I think about the various roles that I've been in, uh, whether it's myself or, or a team member that's just joined, it's normally them that, that kind of ask the question, oh, I, I appreciate that this is the way you're doing things. Is it the best way? Is it the right way? And normally there, there'll be a process change. There'll be a process improvement because of a new starter. So thanks. And I, and I can see that there's a hand up as well, Kat, from Tung, I think. Yeah, so um, Tang Dao, you can ask your question. Um, yes, so um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, so I'm actually international student. So right now I'm final year in La Trobe University. Um, my major is Bachelor of International Business right now. Um, my I actually interested in investment banking. So, but uh, back then, like two years back then, I didn't figure out what I want to do um, until like my last second year. So I figured out that I actually want to do investment bank, but I'm kind of too late to get into internship. Um, in back then. So I actually applied for some summer internship like at UBS or Credit Suisse or JP Morgan um, a few weeks ago. And I actually get myself into like the interview route. I just done with the interview route. So I'm waiting for Super Day. Hopefully I can get to the interview. Um, my question is, um, by any chance, like even when I get internship, like by any chance, like, um, investment bank or any like financial um, firm with high international student since like FK mentioned about like it might take a year to like training them like would they like would employer like waste all the money and resource for international student like when they not so sure like how long this international student can work in the firm as well like visa concern as well like another disadvantage like international law or immigration might bring to them instead of domestic student. And like another question is, like in the case if I don't get the internship, which means I really hard to break into investment bank. So there's might be another, is there any another opportunities that I can get into investment bank if I don't get the internship in the future? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, anybody would like to answer that one? Yeah, no, good question, Sir Tang, and congratulations on reaching like those assessment days. That's extremely good going to get there. Definitely, I think in terms of the types of investment banks you apply to. Um, look, your question there around being an international student would um, an employer invest in you around that? Yeah, absolutely. If you think, and if your employers and they're going, yes, we accept international students. One of the great things that we'll see is, and look, from I did a lot of research. I probably looked back at ten years of research of actually what's the attrition rate of international student of international students at one of my employers. Longevity is a lot higher um, when it comes through. So across your internship, let's remember you've got a short amount of time there, and it's all about the showcasing one. How quickly can you pick up different concepts? You know, in the things and the way in which work done. You're not going to know everything by the end of your internship, but it's more about like the organization seeing going okay here's someone who's come in and they can pick up and pick up them quickly and put that into knowledge they're asking the right questions sort of through that they're showing enthusiasm getting involved in tasks you know that opportunity to, to really sort of work well in the culture and that's what they're going to be going okay i can see that this is someone who can actually deliver on this and do specific tasks brilliant and as we see that piece coming through and you look at your continued work and what your outcome can be and go, oh yeah, there's a lot of value, you know, in here. If I think about how much it costs to take a graduate through, let's say, a two to three year program, and when you can get that return and investment back, from your perspective as an international student, you probably stay a couple of years longer than a domestic student in certain areas. So huge amount of value there. So wouldn't worry, it's all about just doing the best of your ability on that placement, that level of enthusiasm that everyone talked about, that real sort of focus and showing how you can adapt, learn new concepts quickly. You're not going to know everything, but just the bits that you're doing, you can showcase that you get it, you understand it, you can move forward and deliver on pieces of work. You talk about if you are unsuccessful in um, achieving you know, a role, what does that mean for you? Your big thing is just take on board the feedback and see how you can put that into practice for your next application. 
you go through there. Investment banking seems like it's your passion. You thought about this as where you want to go. So think about what the other opportunity to gain an insight into that industry. Are there like virtual internships that you can undertake? You know, we've got those virtual experiences by providers such as Forage. Get through, do them. They're always amazing. Keep going. And we talk about the big piece around understanding culture of an organization. So go into those different events whereby you've got all those sort of investment banks um, available starting to really understand what is it that they look for, asking, the, asking questions of representatives from those investment banks at those events, all things to build up your knowledge, your skill set, and that ability to supply again. So, you know, one of those skills that employees look for, resilience, you know, that persistency. Yeah, all right, we all get knocked down. We all get rejection. Geez, I've got loads of rejections for not applying for grad roles and other roles I've applied to in the past. But it's more how can you sort of pick yourself back up from that and really take that and apply through. And I used to look in my old employer and go, there's someone I know they came through, they got, they were unsuccessful one year for grad role. They came back like a year later. I'm like, they took on board feedback. They delivered absolutely amazing interviews, showcased the skill set. And we're like, this is what we want to see. Someone there who's actually thought about it. It's got that resilience to come back and apply through. So there's always an opportunity. It's just going back, taking on board that feedback and ensuring that you can do the best to your ability when you are on a placement. Hope that helps. Yep, it was very helpful. Thank you. Anybody else would like to add to that? Just a, just a quick one in the, in the lead up to the interview time. Just let the employer worry about how long your longevity is. You go in there and just show your best self and, and smash the interview out. Um, again, it's about backing yourself about about why they initially chose you to get through that assessment round. So let them worry about the rest. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, I'd add to that, Michael and Anthony, exactly what you said is right. From an employer's perspective, they're looking for the best candidate for their organisation. Um, what their longevity is is less, um, I believe, less of an issue because um, at the moment you're actually very lucky looking for jobs at this time of the year. Well, this this at the right about now, um, it, there really is um, a shortage of of good resources um, in Australia based on particularly the movements around um, you know in and out of our shores at the moment. So it, it's there's a couple of things in there. Please always. I suppose take that off the table from your perspective. Just go in there and give, deliver the best interview and show them your best self. Um, they are looking for the best candidate for their team and their organisation. And, um, yeah, just be open and honest and transparent about any um, restrictions, I suppose, around any visa um, or work rights that you have just so you can work through that together. And uh, that's, that's the main thing for them. And I you know, really back Anthony's um, point. It, we talk about when we give a, a no to maybe our graduates that have applied, it's, it's a no now, not a no never. Um, and it's about them, you know, as you said, taking back the opportunity, taking the feedback, you know, grow, develop, come back um, if it's still a place that they think they'd like to work. And it, it is about, it's not always a no never. It's just a no, not right now. There may have been a better candidate at that time. So... Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, okay, so I'll move on to the next question. So what's been the impact of COVID on your organisation and what are the areas of growth and demand are currently out there for accounting and finance graduates? Anybody like to answer that one? Uh, yeah, I might just duck in. Um, so I think Kate touched on this on a previous uh, uh just now, but um, the real growth area because of that, um, those restrictions on the movement in and out of the country, there's been some real uh, shortages in the industry from it, uh, basically just due to those COVID restrictions. Um, that being said, we do have a number of open opportunities, um, but at the same time, there's still an emphasis on hiring the right people for the right roles uh, with the right attitude. Uh, it's certainly not a, a free pass, but the, the opportunities are definitely out there. Um, as far as COVID's had an impact on our organisation, uh, we've sort of obviously uh, had the pivot to everything being on Zoom, Teams. Uh, I think we've got the routine down fairly well by now, um, being lockdown number six. Um, so at first, there was obviously a bit of uh, confusion as to how we'd sort of operate during the environment. Um, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty out in the industry. Um, how on earth were they going to get through um, these lockdowns that they'd sort of started to see um, more around the world at the time? Um, and we really didn't have any idea on what the sort of government supports would be in place uh, to keep everyone sort of ticking along at the time. Um, so in terms of the overall impact of COVID, um, 
it turns out that a lot of the government support did sort of keep our clients um, going during the various uh, rolling lockdowns. Um, in terms of the work we were doing, we were sort of pivoting towards more of less of a let's get your tax returns lodged, more of an advisory piece on how do we get through the next 6, 12, 18 months? Um, what do we need to look at? Do we need to look at things like, um, you know, your commercial rent agreements with your landlords? Do we need to look at things like uh, what's your cash flow even going to look like? Um, if you're shut down tomorrow, what, how are you going to survive? Um, so COVID's really given us a more of a pivot towards the advisory work, but um, there's still the compliance work that goes on in the background. Thanks, Jake. Might, might jump in there as well. But uh, first of all, I'd like to say, just give yourself a pat on the back for choosing kind of finance and accounting. It's, it's a real versatile degree. And, and thankfully, I don't think COVID's necessarily stopped it or limited how many roles are out there. It's rather, like Jake's mentioned, it's pivoted how we do our work. If I, if I kind of put my shoes back in my NAB role, um, there, there was an enormous changes happening in the financial services industry. If you think about things like customer hardship where people are unemployed and, and they need kind of deferrals on their repayments on their personal loans, their home loans, their credit cards. Um, there's also, you, you got to start thinking about the various concepts of what does a vulnerable customer mean? Um, so there's, there's different teams that kind of look at that. So as you can see, there's, there's heaps of different pivots that are happening. And what all these things mean is that there's, they require additional analysts, they require additional consultants, they require additional people in compliance and kind of accounting and, and your financial role. So it, it, it's, it's not necessarily stopped this industry, it's kind of just pivoted the way we do things. So yeah, that's, that's what I'd like to add. Um, I'll jump in too, Catalina. With our organisation, we were um, incredibly lucky about uh, nine months before COVID, we uh, totally renovated our office. We totally updated all our IT um, and we went to Agile Working. And just by fluke, that meant, that, you know, the day of our original first lockdown, our team could pick up their laptops, walk home or no, drive home, go home and uh, plug back in and keep working. There was certainly what we saw probably initially was a scrambling of all a lot of our clients. Um, we do, as I said, pretty much 50-50 audit and business services. Um, from the audit perspective, no one wanted to see an auditor. Um, they, if they didn't need people in their business, they didn't want to. Traditionally, our business has been regionally, um, you know, we, we service, we, we do have a, a client group that is nationwide, being the Bendigo Community Bank Network, which was sort of always done, if you like, remotely, so always from our office. But most of our other work is done on the client side or was done on the client side. So that required a massive change in terms of how our teams worked with the client. Initially, they had to, they didn't want to talk to anybody, they didn't want to see us. They wanted to get their systems and how their business was going to work up and running again and, and pivot, as Jake said. Um, and then they needed to work out how they're going to work with us. And what it what it has resulted in um, is a number of things that probably none of us ever thought of. It's um, really reduced the amount of time that our team are travelling. Um, you know, they might be working on clients up to two hours away. So that, that you know, the, that commute or that overnight stay um, no longer exists um, either as much or at all. And it's been a huge change to people's work-life balance. Um, the other thing is, you know, the, the ch what has really changed has been the ability to use an office as, a, as we used to. And, you know, we don't have that at the moment. And regionally, we are very lucky. We've just gone um, to have some restrictions ease. We can only have 25% of our team in the office. So, you know, we're going to be working remotely for a long time. And what, as organisations that, you know, when you're looking at jobs is how are they keeping their teams connected? Um, how are they engaging with their team members, you know, through a number of little things we've talked about, what sort of activities are they doing, because that will help you understand how do you feel part of this bigger team, even though you're not going to be physically in an office um, all the time anymore. Um, that's, you know, the other guys have touched on the, the impacts on clients, and therefore the work we had to do. I mean, we were all scrambling, um, you know, sort of March, April last year, trying to understand as quick as we could what was happening from all the state and, government, and federal government announcements. Um, what we found is our clients needed us to decipher those and get out to them what it really meant in plain English because at the end of the day, there was so much, in, and sometimes it was hourly, things were changing so quickly. Um, and we just found what we were able to do, them to rely on us more than they ever did. Um, and that loyalty sort of, you know, stick with them through thick and thin because if we can be, um, the person that they can go to for the right advice, as Jake said, to you know get through the the tough times, um, will also be 
there for them in the good times. So um, as a business, it was just knuckled down even more so on our purpose, which is sort of, you know, to, to really help our clients and make sure we really focus on that as well as supporting our team in what was a very different um, environment to work in. Mm -hmm. I think sort of for me, I'll give you a bit of a perspective from what across the industry. And I think for all of you here on the call today, you have got a really great time to be thinking now and joining organizations for internships, for grad roles, as the one thing that COVID has brought to put a lot of emphasis onto employers around actually how do we go about inducting individuals how do we make sure they feel part of our culture especially and connected as everyone said here in this virtual means as there were a lot of organizations in the past who just didn't get this right and didn't really put that much emphasis around it but now they know it's part and parcel it's the huge thing around it so I think for what that initial journey and that transition into a work environment looks like it's going to be absolutely fantastic you know for you um if I look back to sort of this time last year, and I know there's a huge amount of press things, especially if I looked around the practice side of the accounting world, around organizing, oh, we're cutting graduate intakes, you know, there's not enough work around here. And I look at it now, and I can say a lot of those organizations are now just ramping up their grad intakes, going, they've got record numbers of intakes, record highs this year, because, you know, the impact of COVID has brought on a lot more work, you know, for quite a people. At the end of the day, I think, you know, as Michael mentioned, this world of finance, accounting, it's so good in terms of transferable, transferable skills it brings with you. And, you know, one of the big things that sort of myself, my organization talk about around the benefits of the CA program is it builds you into a really great business professional. And you see individuals who move between these different areas from everything from be it management accounting through to taxation through to assurance or be it into more that consulting services and i think that's it now and the whole piece when you think about careers it's now that ability to actually be broad-based in that you know it's taking those transferable skills that lifelong learning and COVID has meant, you know, in the past, you'll see lots of people from overseas coming on in, the job market see the comments or, you know, those workers for two years coming over. With that gone, it's given more opportunity now for sort of you, you know, as those new grads coming into the workforce to get more responsibility in your roles. There's definitely seen career progression being a little bit quicker as well as we build through there. So I think for me, it's a fantastic time to be, you know, involved. And we've seen how everyone's sort of adapted to that virtual environment. And I think for all of you, you know, unfortunately, that past year, you've been doing lots of things in these virtual mediums. You're like, oh, I'm pretty good with this. I know how to like how to act. Oh, one thing I will say, though, when you do transition to work environment, think about that etiquette around how you come across on like Zoom meetings and the rest of it. I know it's all good in here with like cameras off. But when you come to that work environment, that's pretty much a no, no. So it's all thinking around, you know, how you can go about network in building those insights um in that virtual environment but for me the, the shift that we've seen in technology that ability to communicate huge so i think great time for you to be getting into that that environment thanks anthony so that's that sounds really good there's a lot of opportunities out there so just touching on the recruitment process um what would be your tips for so when a student is applying for their first job what's something that um, helps the application to stand out and what are one or two things that you wish students wouldn't do on their job applications so anyone that's involved in the recruitment stage you can answer that one uh, yeah happy to it's been my bread and butter for i've probably like reviewed more cvs and i've had hot meals i reckon across my time um Look, one thing, and I think it goes back to what everyone on the panel said earlier, yeah, understand the culture, just do that bit of research. I think every single recruiter employer knows that you're going to be applying for, you know, countless different organisations, but to increase your chance of being successful, it's just doing that research early on, understanding what, what difference, say, for instance, okay, what's the difference between sort of pitch partners and EY, understanding what's unique around pitch partners and you can go well actually it's there uh, you know at ey i need to go and apply into a particular area for instance whereas a pitch partners it's more of a rotational graduate program that comes through on that it's those type of things is going okay what's that mean to me and this is why i want to go and join um in that business area a huge part so getting that up front is so helpful when it comes through to you know be it that initial interview video interview stage or interview stage or completing your cover letter as to why what's your motivation motivation has been like it's absolutely huge around there 
So um, look, I could talk all day around this, but just very briefly, I'll go. Um, what you know, some tips to probably avoid around there is like just don't do a cut and paste when it comes to CVs, cover letters, anything. Just really ensure you are tailoring it because I know from when I was sitting there reviewing CVs, if I could see, I really want to work at Bendigo Bank, and I, you know, and I was actually not, and I was let's say the Bank of Melbourne. I'll be like, yeah, in the bin. Thank you very much indeed. That's really poor. Going back to the point, attention to detail on there. So you, even if you have the best application in the world, just that little piece around it just shows me you've not thought about it. Um, so there's probably a bit up front, but there's definitely elements at each stage of the process, be it at video interview, psychometric testing, interviews where there are hints and tips that can be involved. But I'll hand over to, to my colleagues on the panel. Thanks, Anthony. I totally agree. Um, the... <laughs> You know, you, you've got to look at it from an employer's perspective. They have got potentially, you know, I don't know, let's call it 50 applications for one role or a 20 application to one role ratio, and they have to differentiate you on a piece of paper. Um, those little mistakes, those addressing it to the wrong person, referring to the wrong job, referring to the wrong employer, will will we'll see you in the bin then uh, quicker than the next person. They won't even turn the page. It's cutthroat, it's reality, um, but it's about, yeah, demonstrating yourself um, through your resume is, is your first opportunity. The other thing is, as an employer, um, we stalk. So, um, you know, we look at social media, um, we look at your LinkedIn, and uh, we see what sort of profile you're building for yourself. So really have a look at and have a think about how you're representing you yourself and your brand through your social media pages as well. Um, if you haven't got a LinkedIn profile, get one. Um, it is you know, the business platform now that people will look to you and start engaging in organisations, um, membership groups that, that are, 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 you know, within your industry or within passions and interests um, and just sort of start to get involved with that. Have a look through your, your public profile on your, um, you know, Facebook and link, um, Instagram, that sort of thing, what's on there and, and would, an employee, would you want your employer to see that? Um, the other thing is a pet hate is when I get to the end of an interview and I ask, do they have any questions? And they say no um nothing I want you to come into an interview knowing wanting to know if this is the right place for you to work as well not just the right you're the right candidate for us um so you know always have some questions some really simple ones are like why do you love working here I just ask them right back um what's been their best experience um you know do you have a social club or what do you do for social you know online now how do you keep your team connected um, just some really simple things like that. Some training. What what do you do? What what does a one year look like as a graduate? They might not have explained that. Um, so just have some key questions because it just shows you've done your research. You're interested in finding out whether this is the right role for you as well, um, and you've got that, that um, interview smarts. Um, they're probably the the top couple of things for me. And and just from me, don't don't be shy to include some of your experiences that you've had on your resume. I know some of you you might you might just be in a part time job at maybe McDonald's. You might not even have a part time job. Think think about clubs that you've been involved in during your time at Latrobe. Um, if you've been involved in a kind of debate club or a public speaking club, those are really things that uh, we look favourably on. If you've been on student exchanges, really shows that you kind of adapt to different environments and things like that. Um, and it's absolutely not too late if you haven't done any of those things. Um, although they may largely run virtually now, I'm sure La Trobe has a whole host of different um, clubs and organisations and committees you can kind of join to really bolster your resume. I could say that one of the great things to do, right? Here at La Trobe, you've got the amazing support of Catalina and the team. You utilise them because you know, the amount of engagement that Kathleen and the team will have with sort of industries, um, also insights around be it how to approach interviews, cover letters, those different clinics, like massively beneficial. Like I remember sort of working through with one of my employers and we did a lot of work with the trade around this is the type of thing that the sector looks for around here. So they've got that knowledge to utilize the team as that's going to be so helpful for just guiding you around how to approach um, the, you know, navigate your way through that assessment process. And I think, as you know, as Michael mentioned there, so transferable skills can come from anywhere and everywhere, you know, from, it doesn't have to be that relevant work experience because not everyone, to be honest, most people don't have relevant work experience when applying for an internship or, you know, only a few do when going for grad roles. It is just broadly, how can you adapt 
you know what you've learned from the different environments that you've been been in there and that's such a such a good thing and you know for me i know a lot of international students go how can i really stand out with this an international student you travel to australia from overseas there's so much rich information in there that you can get down and weave into like an application or an interview and it's like wow this is great and some of the best interviews i've seen have been individuals who have been able to do that probably one other thing on on your cover letter um, when you are tailoring it if it is if you are applying for a role that's not local to you um, make sure you reference that in your cover letter. So we're regional, um, you know, you're in Melbourne. Are you willing to commute? Do you think you're going to be able to work remotely? Um, so you're acknowledging, I know this isn't uh, maybe an opportunity for me that's local, but I'm willing to travel. I've actually got family and friends and connections up there already. I've travelled there previously. I know where I'm looking at. So just so we know it's not a cookie cutter CV that you've just pumped off to everybody. Um, we don't want you to waste our time any much as we don't want to waste yours. Yeah, completely agree with Kate there um, on the non-local applications. Just anecdotally, uh, we had an application for the graduate program came in from someone in Perth. Um, and, you know, without them specifically mentioning in that cover letter, I'm looking to move to Melbourne because I have, you know, family down here. Um, then we would have, yeah, it would have gone straight in the bin otherwise. So it's just the nature of it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so definitely check out, I've posted a couple of links onto the chat, our Career Ready Advantage program. So if you haven't already, we do have some career counsellors who will help you with your CVs and read through your cover letters and things like that. And we also have the industry mentoring program. So if you haven't signed up for that, I've just posted up the link there. Um, so just having a look at time, it's uh, approaching one o'clock. So if any students have any questions, please feel free to put your hand up or you can um, just type it into the chat and I can ask it for you. Um, so just finally, um, the final question is, what would you have told your younger self during your final year of your degree? So if we can go back in time, the panelists' lives, if there's something that you would have told yourself in your final year, what would that be? So I'll start with Kate. Oh gosh, I remember, <laughs> I remember going for jobs and just thinking this is a world outside of anything I have ever known before. Um, just be bold. Um, be brave and um, you know it, it is about you know that that good sick feeling um, put yourself out there it's there's a whole world waiting for you that first job won't define you for the rest of your life um, it may be a stepping stone to a future you don't even know that you want yet um, just back yourself have a go and you know don't don't make the assessment of you allow the employer to do that um don't discount yourself for a job or I, I remember my interview i still remember it clear as day um with price waterhouse and i walked out and i thought i'm just this little country girl um i went to you know back then it was a bit of a group interview style um, i was the only one in a pantsuit everyone else was in a skirt suit and i'm like oh you know well, the girls were um and you know and i just thought oh i just appeared like i'm the little country girl in the big city and i'll you know I felt like related to the interview quite well, but I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm, I made the assessment and of course got a, a shock when I got uh, an offer to, to, to work there. So yeah, back yourself, have fun, enjoy the process, um, learn from it, uh, get feedback if you can, um, so you can grow and develop, but yeah, get focus on your uni, get that out of your road. Um, probably, so oh, I'm actually going to retract that. At the moment, um, because the there is so many opportunities out there start looking for opportunities now um they we, we um, and most organizations will um will take undergrads as they finish uni part-time and work part-time or a bit of some sort of hybrid model um there are opportunities out there to be had uh, don't think you have to have your degree and a bit of paper before you start applying um they may not be advertised as an intern role and, and someone that might suit an undergrad but just approach them and just say are you would you take on um, somebody that uh, is an undergrad but um, yeah it's there's there's opportunities out there don't make the assessment on behalf of the employer just put yourself out there for that opportunity thanks Kate, there. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Um, if I were to think about my time there's just a few quick things that I'd probably do Kate's mentioned the first big one is if you don't have a LinkedIn get one today um, join a bunch of networks that you're interested in, whether it be the finance companies, accounting companies, whatever it may be. 
Um, again, feel free, we'd be more than happy to connect. I'm sure I speak on behalf of all the panelists here um, if you have any questions following this. Um, cast the net wide when you're applying for jobs. Don't just uh, apply for, I know, Tang, I'm not going to pick on you, but you've mentioned three companies that you're really interested in. Think broadly about other companies that can get you to those uh, dream jobs that you're talking about. So really cast your net wide. Um, and think about those various avenues. There's Seek, there's LinkedIn, and then there's just simple networking opportunities where you jump on LinkedIn and somebody might have a job availability and you have a chat with them. Um, so don't, don't get too um, worried about kind of the COVID situation. You can't meet people in person um, and don't get too caught up with certain companies that you want to work for. And if those companies don't take you, you go into a shell. So yeah, there's a lot of graduate programs available now, a lot of internship programs available now. So start looking uh, and start applying. Um, and if you get through to the interview um, process, give yourself a pat on the back. That's a really great step. And, you, and, you're, and you're developing your interview skills, which is another big skill um, in itself. Um, yeah, I, I think if I look back to myself and I'm going, I think it would have been just getting out there, understanding a bit more, doing that research, understanding you know what, what I'm really sort of passionate about, what my skills, where they can sit. And I think all of you sort of on the line today are doing the right thing by attending an event such as this to find out a bit more around, be it certain employers, but what are those skill sets? Um, you know, I know my colleague Marissa sort of posted in the chat there a link to our um, CA and Ed student affiliate um, sign up, which is super because there's so much information in there that helps give you an insight into an industry and, and different employers and the events that we look to run through. And I think that's hugely important, just having that understanding and taking that time. Like I was shocking back at uni. I just totally missed out. I only went to events because they used to give out free food. And I was like, yeah, I'll get involved with some of those ones. But I should have spent more time listening through. And my other piece of advice is, I know it's tough when we're there and we, we talked about this whole applying through. And at times you feel like you've got to be like, oh, I need to go and apply for those big brand names out there, you know. Um, but they're not the be all and end all. There's so many different opportunities and there's so much insight you can get from a wide variety of organisations. So just getting out there and doing your research and not defining success as being I need to go and work for this particular brand it's more about actually what's the intricacies what can I be doing in my work your career path can go in so many different directions and everyone gets there in the end it might just be a little bit around here up there there but you can get to your end goal so just you know keep on going doing what you're doing positive attitudes and attend different events yeah completely agree with Anthony um I mean if I had to go back and tell myself, well, a couple of things really is a, what are you doing with yourself in uni? Um, Cause I was, you know, you've done better than me by coming to one of these events. So that's definitely a positive first step. Um, and number two is take every opportunity that you can possibly find and just go for it. You're not going to get, you know, it's never going to be hundred percent successful, but try and take something away from every single time you apply for something or you make it through to an interview round or an assessment center. It's really, at the end of the day, if you don't get it the first time, you do it enough times, you'll get there. Um, one of the biggest sort of pieces is we sometimes see people who have been to multiple assessment centers and you know, they might not have made it through to the, um, their, um, their first application, but um, they've sort of taken on board all the feedback, everything they've um, had come across on the journey um, and sort of consolidated it to where they are today. Um, if I look back to how I was in uni, I had oh, pretty rubbish marks, to be honest. Um, I really didn't apply as, apply myself as, as best as I should have. And I really didn't put myself out there for applications. Um, so I would encourage you all, don't make the same mistakes I did. So just learn from the mistakes. I've been on the journey already. And uh, yeah, that's what I would tell myself. Um, get out there, apply for everything. Every opportunity not applied for is an opportunity missed, so. Thanks, Jake. Um, so we've got a question from Alyssa. Alyssa, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, hello. Um, I'd just like to say a hi to Kate because she's my previous employer. So it's good to see you, Kate. Um, I have a question about work-life balance. Um, I do a lot of work in my community. I'm heavily involved in my church and I'm also a treasurer for a committee. Um, 
And I was just wondering what have been your experiences of starting a graduate role and um, yeah, um, working full time while doing a accreditation, um, if you did one um, and such, like how did you balance that? Happy to answer that one, Alyssa. Thanks, thanks for the question. Thanks for jumping off camera. Uh, nice to meet you. So um, yeah, really, again, congratulations with getting involved in your community and having those extracurricular activities. A really great step and a really good thing to have on your resume for when you do um, go for those graduate roles. Um, obviously, your, your experiences are going to be different to everyone else on the call in terms of what the job demands when you get into your graduate role. Um, but really kind of understand what the requirements are. Um, and my advice to you, especially at the start of it, really kind of fully put, immerse yourself within the role. So you really get a grasp of what's required of the role, um, who your team members are and how you can really thrive in the role. Um, but there is obviously that work-life balance. Don't stay up till 8, 8, 8 p.m. kind of doing your job. Make sure you keep your routine, whatever that may be. If it's kind of um, going to your church or on whatever basis it might be, continue to do that. Um, and, and kind of let your employer know. I'm sure that's going to make for a really great conversation on how you're involved in your community. So um, apply yourself, whether it's a kind of ordinarily, I know this is kind of a very loose concept, but you've got your nine to five, immerse yourself fully in your role, obviously take your breaks wherever you need it, um, and then absolutely continue extracurricular activities. I think it's really great that you're involved in those things. So don't, don't let that go. Hello, Alyssa. <laughs> um, hope you don't mind me sharing. So Alyssa did her gap year with us um, and she did a, an administration traineeship before heading off to uni. So it's lovely to see you again. It's really um, good. With your, with your question, and I think probably as, um, as you start as a graduate, maybe your time demands um, aren't as strong as potentially when you get to more of a senior, which is when you're also studying your uni UCA, for example, um, it, it, it can be quite a challenge. And I think probably more broadly, um, just balancing work life is that it's that work life integration, maybe than a balance. Um, you, you can't do anything with balance all the time or everything with balance all the time, but it's about integrating those things. And I think Michael made a really great point. Talk to your employee about the things you're passionate about outside of work and how how that integration, you know, potentially would would uh, be if, if there's opportunities to integrate that, uh, whether that's from taking some leave or some flexibility within your week, if there's a commitment uh, during the week. Um, yeah, just, just what that might look like. I think once you get to sort of studying CA and Anthony and Marissa might have something else to say about this, but um, we encourage our teams to not necessarily uh, do everything in an 18 month period, but that there might be some times that aren't going to actually work for them to do that CA module. So that might be work commitments or it might be some personal commitments. And Again, having the conversation with your employer that this is my plan and this is why. Um, you know, I may not, you know, enrol in this unit or this semester um, because I've, you know, got some other commitments. And we want you more than anything is when you commit to something um, that you do it wholeheartedly. So, you know, having the conversation up front will, you know, will um, just set you up for more success. Thanks, Kate. Um, Anthony, did you want to add to that? Oh, well, I think that whole piece around sort of work-life well-being is a huge thing. And, um, you know, I think every single organisation is thinking now, what can we do? How can we support sort of each individual as we go through? Um, that I think if you look back over the last year and that sort of impact of COVID and the ability to go and provide people the space to get involved in those other commitments outside of work, that's it. You know, I, I would absolutely Catholic say when you start to go through and from discussions I'm having with lots of those sort of recruits at different organisations, they're like, as we go through that interview process, it's really that focus around not just the work, but it's you as an individual, you holistically outside of that. What do you do? What are you passionate about? What are those sort of commitments that you have? And then how that can sort of flow through into that work life and ensuring that you can find that level of balance. And all right, there's definitely times when it's going to be whoa intense as you go through there um, in certain pieces, but it's absolutely what do you do and how do you get balance in your life's a huge thing. And I think as Kate mentioned there, yeah, as you go through and if you do like the CA program, there are recommendations where we're up front and go, we expect that you need to spend around about 10 hours a week on there. I mean, you've got eight years in which to actually go through and complete the program before you're asked to go and redo any modules on there. And so realistically, it's about balancing. And over the last year, we've seen a lot of people go, that's so starting, they've gone, you know, I'm going to pause for this semester and just take some time out, you know, because I just need it to, you know, get through everything that's been going on at the moment. 
and that was absolutely fine. You know, we actively encourage that. And, uh, you know, across that profession, there's a lot of work with our CA members around how can we ensure that level of well-being. Like, it's interesting this morning I was having a chat actually with my boss and he goes, oh, I'm going to go and chat to someone who's just transitioning into the work around how we get that balance through there. Is there more that we can be doing to showcase? How can we support those individuals at the early stage of their careers with getting that balance right? Because I think there's a definitely a piece that a lot of people go, oh, you know, I've just started my job. I've got to keep working all hours on the sun and just show that I can actually do this, which is it's not okay because that's how you burn out sort of through there and you need to get that level of balance through. I think every organisation is really receptive of that. But that's my opinion. I don't know. Jake may differ from his experience of Dotson work and going through CA programme, though. Uh, well, just for some context, I finished the CA programme uh, end of last year. So um, I had a bit of that. Thank you. Um, I had a bit of that working through both COVID, CA, doing everything remotely, but also working back in the office doing the CA. Um, I think at the end of the day, every employer that you work for is going to be very mindful of work-life balance, um, especially given the current circumstances. It's been a bit of a renewed focus, uh, at least in our organisation, around work-life balance. How do you really disconnect from work? Because you do need to disconnect from work, recharge yourself, um, whether that be through, um, through, your, uh, through your community work or um, going to church or everyone sort of disconnects a bit differently. Um, obviously, for some, that will be quite difficult at the moment and certainly a challenge that uh, everyone's aware of. But uh, it's just important that work will always be there, but at the same time, don't neglect your life. It's called work-life balance for a reason. It's not just work and then more work. Thanks, Jake. I uh, hope that answered your question, Alyssa. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you all. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and just finally, Hannah has a question. Hi everyone, um, thank you for the talk today. It's been um, really good and informative. I just have a question regarding, um, so with my life after high school, I didn't decide automatically what I wanted to do. So I have a bit of a gap when it comes to my CV about what I've been doing um, before coming to La Trobe and studying accounting. I'm just wondering how that looks to an employer um, whether that's something in an interview where the, it would be probed and I'd have to um, say, you know, what happened in that gap or whether it's something that's just acknowledged and I can say where I'm at now. Uh, I'll just chime in here. Um, I think to an employer, from an employer perspective, uh, if it ever was something to ask about, um, I can't say in my experience it really had too much of a bearing, but... Uh, if it is something to ask about, being honest and upfront with exactly what happened um, would be the course of action. I mean, um, in my experience, I, I graduated uni and I spent a whole year trying to find a position. Um, when I had my interview that was queried and I was honest and upfront, I said, look, I applied for a lot of graduate positions. I wasn't successful, but um, here I am now. Um, I spent a whole year working in a fish and chip shop that year. So from... Uh, from an employer's perspective, it's all, it's all going to be about the attitude um, and then your approach towards, you know, if anyone asks, but just being honest and upfront about it. I agree with that. I, I think, you know, what, what Jake said there, um, it really depends on your situation. So one, if it's a case of something that's very sort of personal that you had to work through, then it, it's probably one that you may, you know, what I've what done in the past is just like contacted, be it like a, an HR representative or, you know, an individual just said, look, it's a personal reason as to what's happened there. I'm happy and it's up to you if you want to go and disclose sort of what that is. Um, there's definitely been occasions where I've been interviewing and, you know, someone has discussed it and it's been, you know, really sort of, well thought through and I can understand why it made them the person that they are today and I was like okay this is amazing others it's like pretty much we'll yeah, we won't talk about that I understand that something's happened and that's fine and we'll, we'll keep on going through but it all depends on whether you want to disclose or not and I think rightly as Jake said there if it's something more a case of you just weren't sure what type of career direction you want to go in then I think that gives a great story to an interviewer as to like how you took that time you know yes you've worked these certain jobs but how they bring forward that this is why I now actually want to go through to uni. This is why I want to go down this career path. It's just, it's all about telling that story of you. And I think that's so powerful when it comes through into that interview scenario.
Thanks, Anthony. I um, hope that answered your question, Hannah. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our session. I just wanted to ask the panelists if they would like to advertise any opportunities that are at your organizations or events or initiatives. Um, please feel free to send the links on the chat or you can chat about it now. Does anybody want to promote or plug any of anything? Um, I'll yeah. jump in, Katrina. Yeah. Um, we're in Bendigo. We're a regional organisation. Uh, we recruit uh, pretty much on a six monthly um, basis, uh, particularly uh, graduates at that level. But um, jump on. I suppose any any organisation that you're interested in working with, make sure you follow them on social media so you see any of those alerts as well that maybe they don't come through Seek. So they may have some programs they run through their own. Uh, organizations and uh, yeah jump on and keep an eye for those I know for, for ours we recruit um, to, to start with us sort of at December and at June um, but that recruitment runs you know a few months prior to that there we have both internship opportunities and graduate opportunities um, within an organization and we'll have um, probably between six and ten opportunities in the next 12 months across all those sort of roles so yeah there's quite a bit of act activity um, regionally and uh, jump on follow us on socials and you'll see um, anything that pops up our next recruitment will start at the end of September um, but yeah I, I think just more broadly jump on anything that you want to be connected with so you can see what's happening in that space. Um, at CA, we we connect with a number of different organisations. We've got some fantastic events, and I think my colleague Marissa posted in around our um, our link there to sign up a student affiliate, and that gives you access to some amazing events. So we have an event coming up, I think, on the 25th, am I right, Marissa, for not your typical nine to five, which provides insights into the sort of diversity within the profession. We've got great things at our Achiever program, which is our internship um, opportunity. And for that, we actually do work with both EY and Picture Partners. And Kate, I'll be reaching out to you at some point as well to talk about ways that we can collaborate sort of coming through. Um, but there's some amazing opportunities there. And I think as all the panelists have said, like it's just getting involved, getting out to those different events. Um, if you check our site, there's also a link to a virtual experience via Forage. So that gives you a bit of an insight into what you know life could be like as well within that account profession so highly recommend get on there have a look through but as michael said just reach out to everyone as well and connect with us and happy to have a conversation i might just give us a plug as well uh, but uh so picture partners has a two-year graduate program it's based on three eight-month rotations throughout various service lines within the firm um, so there might be a mix of tax audit um, and the work i do in private business family advisory um, it's basically a two-year program because we've sort of taken the approach that your graduate journey is sort of that two-year process. The first year, um, and this is from my own experience as well, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. And you just uh, try and pick up, learn as much as you can. The second year, you're sort of looking at, okay, I know a few things, I've seen this before, and you're working through a consolidation journey. Um, as far as the, our graduate program, uh, we're still... Actually, we opened up last week on the 2022 graduate program um, to go back to market for some additional graduates. Um, so that opened last week. Highly encourage um, all of you to apply. I'd love to see some of your names um, in the pile of CVs uh, when we do go to review them. Um, and in the meantime, uh, more than happy to connect with anyone on uh, LinkedIn. Just feel free to reach out and uh, happy to answer any questions. Right, right. Uh, end us off there. Um, might take this opportunity again um, to say thank you for your time today and really well done on kind of joining this and using your lunch hour or the hour in the day to kind of come and learn something new. Um, I've included a link there to all the opportunities available at EY. Um, there's everything from kind of graduate programs, intern programs for those that are in, might be in your penultimate year, um, and also some cadetship programs for those that might want to have a bit of a balance between study and work and see what that looks like. So a bunch of opportunities there. Again, um, if you do have any questions on that in particular or anything else today, please um, connect on LinkedIn. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Latrobe University and all the students, we'd like to thank all the panelists for taking the time out today, for sharing your insights and your experience. Um, we appreciate it so much. I know all the students here will appreciate. Um, and yeah, so just thank you. And hopefully we'll see you again for some future events.
Um, so to all the students out there, please um, register your attendance on the, the form that's just on there for Career Hub, especially if those who are doing the Career Advantage program. Don't forget that we do have a career ready team that's happy to assist you with your CVs, your resumes, um, and stay up to date with um, any events by checking your student email. We'll be sending you through a few more events for the, re the rest of the year, um, and also the industry mentoring program. So if you're still interested in registering for that, the link is also there. So once again, thanks everybody for tuning in today. I hope everyone stays safe and keep well, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.